My name is Dane. I'm the worship minister here. And I tell you what, I cannot get away from this kick drum. It follows me everywhere I go, even on stage today. So first off, if you are instrumentally talented or even can use your foot, I could use your help on the worship team. Uh, we've got so many places here on our tech industry, uh, tech industry, tech team, uh, and, our, uh, yeah, and our worship team. So if you've got that, please reach out to me, and I'm going to put this kick drum down. Anyways, this kick drum is reminding me of a very specific time in my life that I thought I was way cooler than I actually was, and no, that's not today. It's not today, I promise. Um, I, I've been humbled. I know, I know where I'm at. Around college age, I had the chance to change up with what I was wearing and pick up what style I wanted to wear. And, uh, you know, you, you, you look around, and, and I was at a Christian private school for my high school, so I was very used to basketball shorts, khaki pants, and about as creative as I could get was either red polo or green polo. Sometimes I'd throw in the blue polo to spice it up. Um, but when I went to college... I needed to grow up and dress myself. So I looked around at bands that I would listen to, and I found a style that I thought I liked. And it was uh, consisted of these boots, skinny jeans, flannel shirts, you know, all the good comfy stuff. Uh, I grew out this crazy long beard that I know my grandmother didn't like. You know, she would subtly hint at it every single time. And I probably had that thing way too long until COVID came around and my haircut got canceled. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to switch it up. The beard got shorter. The hair got longer. Um, but I looked at the culture around me for my style. I started listening to these uh, hipster bands is what they're called. Hipster, if you've never heard that word. Um, bon Iver or the Arctic Monkeys, or the Black Keys, and of course, Mumford and Sons, right? These guys right here. Uh, I very much wanted to be like them, and you know, I could stand here with a guitar, and I could sing like, I will wait for you, uh, and just hit this kick drum all day, if you'd let me. These dudes made me buy a banjo, and I'm never forgiving them for that. I'm never forgiving them for that. The hipsters got me. Now, what is a hipster? According to the internet, because it's trustworthy, right? Uh, hipsters, they are people who try too hard to be different. And they genuinely think that they are different by rejecting anything they deem to be too popular. And ironically, so many other people also try too hard to be different. They all end up winding up the same. Especially in their alternative styles, which are all popular now, thanks to the other hipsters. Now, they might not be as popular anymore. I think it's starting to get outdated as I'm approaching my 30s. But I remember the day that I became self-aware that I conformed to that hipster crowd. I walked into a coffee shop that, guess what, I eventually worked for. And um, this coffee shop, it was, you know, homey environment. It was, it was an awesome place. Cool music was always playing. The baristas were friendly. But I had never drank a cup of coffee in my life. I was a poser, I tell you what. And I was there with my friends, and these people were ordering matchas and chais and pumpkin spice, you name it, you know. Uh, I felt this pressure of ordering something that was so worthy of an Instagram post. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be cool now. Um, and there was this, must have been this really confused look on my face when I was staring at the menu. Because one of my friends stepped in, and he just ordered for me. He said, hey, here's a black coffee. I was like, oh, okay, black coffee. I was like, so do you like put anything in? No, don't, just, just drink it. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, he's like, if you can drink it black, you know you like coffee. I hated it. I hated it. It was awful. And, and, and I believe that it is like God given to us because, man, it's an acquired taste because I can't go a day without it now. Whew. See, we live in a world, though, with a society that is filled with pressures to conform especially as we are trying to find our own place in it. The hipster tried to break that trend, but fell trapped to it. I fell trapped to it. Today we're stepping into Daniel chapter 3, where the lives of three young men who have been displaced from their home in Jerusalem and taken captive by the kingdom of Babylon and the rule of King Nebuchadnezzar. These young men, they were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But those weren't their real names. They weren't the names that they were given by their parents when they lived back in Judah. See, these men, they were close friends with Daniel, but they were renamed by the Babylonians on their arrival to the city in their captivity. Their real Hebrew names were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. 
And these young men, they were trying to find their place in the world. But even in their names, they were forgotten by the Babylonians, though their names were core to these three young men. Hananiah's name, it meant Yahweh. God has been gracious. But in exile, the Babylonian kingdom changed it to Shadrach, meaning inspired by Aku. And Aku was the god of the moon. Mishael's name meant who is what God is. And the Babylonian kingdom changed it to Meshach, belonging to Aku. And Azariah meant Yahweh, God has helped. But the Babylonian kingdom changed it to Abednego, servant of Nebo, the Babylonian god of wisdom. See, their real names gave glory and honor to God. But in this displaced kingdom that they found themselves in, the Babylonian names did anything but honor the one true God. See, these men, they were in a society, a kingdom that most certainly pressured them to conform to the worship patterns that were set before them. Their names, they were forgotten by the society they lived in, but they were certainly not forgotten by God. And so we pick up our story in Daniel chapter 3. If you have your Bible, you can open up there. Uh, if you have the YouVersion app, you can go to events. You can find Discover Christian Church under events. You'll have a sermon outline. You'll have notes. You'll have links to our websites to see what's all is going on around here in our community at Discover. I highly encourage you to go, go visit that and check that out. So here in Daniel chapter 3, this comes right after the prophet Daniel interpreted a dream for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. He had this wacky dream where there was this large statue, and it was made up of four different kinds of metals. It's oddly specific, and, and he was just lying awake at night not knowing what the dream meant. He, he tried to get people to interpret it, and nobody could, and then finally comes along Daniel. In this statue, the head was made of gold. The chest and the arms were made of silver, the belly and the thighs were made of bronze, and the legs and the feet were made of iron and clay. See, God allowed Daniel to interpret these parts of the statue as kingdoms that would dominate his world powers after Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. And looking back at that through our course of history, we know that to be Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And Daniel, he told the king, he said, Babylon is the head of gold which means kingdoms are going to rise after you, Nebuchadnezzar. And do you think a king would like to hear that? At first, he was just grateful for his dream that it was interpreted, and, and through God's work in Daniel, king had set Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, his friends, to a higher office in his royal court. King Nebuchadnezzar, he, he began by praising Daniel's God for the answer to his dreams, but then I think the reality hit in as he only praised for a moment. Verse 3. Or verse 1 in chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. That's about 90 feet tall. And he set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, the prefects, the governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. And so the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all other provincial officials whew, assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. And then the herald, as heralds do, they loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you're commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, of the flute, of the zither, I don't know what a zither is, I'm sorry, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Benny, that's kind of how I knew them growing up from the story of VeggieTales. So much like, of my preparation this week, I got distracted by just re-watching the VeggieTales. Um, I wanted to come out singing like, the bunny, the bunny, the bunny, but, you know, regardless. This statue, it is no mistake that it is made completely of gold. It's because when King Nebuchadnezzar, he learned of the possibility of his kingdom fading, he made a statement. He said, hey, not just the head of this statue is going to be gold like in my dream, but it is going to be gold from head to toe. Nebuchadnezzar, he made a statement. He wants his kingdom to reign forever, that there would be no kingdoms after his. Now, worshiping statues seems a little weird to me, but it was very normal for a society of Babylon. Here at church, we often hear the term idol, 
and idol worship, it is all too common in the ancient cultures where they believed in polytheism, that multiple gods would make our world go round. And the term idol is Greek in its origin. It means worship of images. And I tried to check out the biblical Hebrew, and there's no, no simple equivalent that exists, but later Hebrew uses this term that I kind of got focused in on, and it's this term. It's, it's avodah zorah. And it's often translated to idolatry, but the root of the word, it takes us deeper, and it refers more generally to the practices that are considered wrong or foreign to the people of God. And a better translation of avodah zorah is strange worship. Strange worship. And so in ancient Jewish thought, the worship of another god, king, or political system, it was a form of strange worship. And here's how strange conforming to Nebuchadnezzar's demand for worship looks like. Anytime anyone in the kingdom of Babylon heard any music of any kind, they were to stop what they were doing. They were to turn in the direction of this large idol. Everyone in Babylon would know your allegiance to the king when the music played. Imagine the disruption that that would bring to our lives today, that if every time you heard music, you had to stop what you were doing. Like, like if I'm going down uh, the highway and I hear somebody's windows down and they're kicking the beat drum and it's, it's Mumford and Sons and I had to like pull over and find the nearest Starbucks and bow down to it or something, I don't know. Um, regardless, if you're, if you're on like a, a walk with your husband or wife and you just hear music, your favorite song uh, by the radio, you'd have to stop and turn and bow. If somebody is playing an uh, instrument on the street for money, you'd have to stop. You'd have to figure out what direction it is. You have to turn and bow. If anybody wanted to know if you were loyal to the king, they could have just whistled and tested your allegiance to see if you would turn and bow. Wow. See, I hear this and I wonder what I would do. And, and I'd like to think, man, I, I hope I wouldn't bow down to a gold statue. <laughs> like, like maybe, maybe if I did, God would be understanding, right? Like God, God doesn't want me to be burned in flames. Uh, would he? Or, 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 or my convictions, would they set in? Like how could I bow down to something so trivial like a golden statue? And, and you know, I honestly don't know what I would do, but I hope I know what I would do. It seems obvious. Don't bow down to the giant idol. I wish today's idols looked more obvious, like 90-foot giant statues. To me, that's so obviously strange worship. But today, strange worship, it, it might not be a statue, but rather it might be found woven into the fabric of our everyday lives. Like the objects of our worship, they could appear, appear as familiar or even essential parts of our day. Things that we chase after, things we sacrifice for, things we prioritize above all else. These modern idols might not look like ancient gods, but they still demand our allegiance, our time, and energy in ways that can pull us away from God's kingdom. They can pull us away from what truly matters, and it pulls us back into this strange worship. Now, what are some examples of, of strange things we can worship? Well, we can obviously conform to the strange worship of, like, the internet and social media, for example, it pulls us in its orbit, right? We know that, that it can craft a curated, perfect life for the world to see. We compare ourselves to friends and these influencers. We surround ourselves with the opinions and voices of people that we want to hear. Otherwise, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to unfollow. See, we mirror lifestyles that we choose. We buy into the things that they endorse, hoping to become more like them, or, or there's security or identity in that. Our sense of worth, it becomes tangled with likes, shares, comments, and just fitting in with like-minded people. In social media, it's framed as something that unites. Um, but do you think it always does that? Uh, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, I, I think sometimes it does the opposite. And I think as disciples of Jesus, we have this responsibility to hold it at a distance, to take breaks from it, to, and, and to use our platform and to use our circles to lead in the example of bringing the kingdom of God into our families and our friends and our world. And so please, friends, just consider what you say online, because if it can cause division, I bet you it will. <laughs> and perhaps, you know, the more effective way of communicating with somebody is in person. How much more meaningful is a phone call? How much more meaningful is a conversation over dinner? See, we can also conform to this strange worship of the things that we do, like our occupation and our jobs. Um, 
somebody asks you, like, you meet someone for the first time. Hey, they say, what's your name and what do you do? And uh, our jobs often get mixed in with our identity. We put our identity in what we do. Here's the problem with that. I don't feel like I've ever done enough. Like, it seems endless. Like, like, there's always more to do. There's always either more money to make. There's always more product that we can put out. There's always more efficiency that can happen. And it can so easily, directly, and indirectly convince us to prioritize things that distract us rather than the ethics and values of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God needs workers who stand out and introduce kingdom values to the workplace. People over production. Uplifting the lowly rather than just, you know, endlessly collecting for ourselves. See, we can also conform to this strange worship of the cultural norms around us that can dictate what is acceptable in our relationships or our family structures or our lifestyle choices. The world and in society and in the circles we live in often prescri- prescribe like very narrow views of success and identity. Um, they shape expectations based on like gender or ethnicity or, or how much money you make. And there's a lot of pressure Uh, to worship and to fit into these predefined roles. And it can so easily become the center of who we are. Students, we can conform to the strange worship of our schools sometimes. See, not just like the worship of our our school sports teams, but also, uh, or school spirit, but, but through just this relentless pressure to excel, right? Studying hard is important. Do that, but take breaks and rest. Prioritize. Remember to walk in faith and put it into your daily practice because you are so much more than just the things that you consume your time with when you study. We can conform to this strange worship of pop culture, like the latest health and fitness ads. We are, we're constantly told how we should look, feel, and live. Like, this thing's gonna fix you. Entertainment we watch also plays its part. Like, I tell you what, I wasted my Friday night watching a boxing match I shouldn't have. What a waste. And anyways, entertainment. See, we watch, it it plays this part. It shapes our preferences. It consumes our time. Oh man, we conform to the strange worship of politics. Left, right, center, libertarian. See, politics, it can conform. It it demands conformity. It does. It, It pulls for allegiances. There's often an unspoken expectation to align with popular political views or movements And stepping outside of the opinion of the community you're in, it can often result in isolation or backlash. And man, that sucks. The amount of friends that I know who don't talk to their parents because there's just a broken relationship there because of politics, it astounds me. It astounds me. Jesus followers, be cautious. Check your allegiances because political idolatry, it is avodah zorah. It is strange worship. It builds a worldview where political power and identity become enmeshed into one's controlling narrative for making sense of the world around them. And I know that there are some Christians that see state power as the primary context for bearing witness of the gospel of Christ. But when I read my Bible, I know it's so much more than that. Don't misplace your loyalty to the kingdom of God and the global church as the primary narrative that shapes and informs followers of Christ. Now, see, these are all just little aspects of our lives. And God, he wants us to take these things in in moderation. Because when we get fully consumed, that's when it becomes strange worship. So we keep one foot into the kingdoms of this world. We put one foot into the kingdom of God. And we know the difference where our worship rests. So pause for a moment and listen. Do you hear it? The kick drum's going. Music, it's playing. The kingdoms of the world are hitting the kick drum. We are facing a decision to fall into strange worship or the worship of our one true God. See, last week, Steve, he led us to a great point. Wherever you are, remember who you are and live as a child of the king. And when the kingdoms of this world demand strange worship, we remember who we are, we trust in God's kingdom, even if we are unsure and don't know the outcome. 
And for the three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, nothing is stranger to them than bowing down to anyone or anything other than the God of the universe. And in that moment, they remembered their names. They remembered who they are. The three young men, they faced this fork in the road. Conform to the strange worship of this culture that's surrounding you. Or stay true to your name, your true identity. Worship Yahweh, the one true God who is over and in and through all. They remembered their names. They remembered God is gracious. They're is no one like him and he is our helper do you know your name do you know who you are as the child of the one true king we can't read this verse enough first peter 2 9 to 10 it says you are a chosen people a royal priesthood a holy nation you are god's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light once you were not a people but now you're a people of god once you had not received mercy but now you have received mercy disciples of jesus because of jesus because of his victory on the cross we live in the presence of our god in his kingdom Your value is not in your accomplishments. It is not in the strange things we tend to worship. You've been chosen by God as his very own. He he calls you by name. You have worth because of what he does. In the kingdom of God, it extends far beyond the limitations of the kingdoms here on earth. See, God's chosen people will be worshiping God long after everything else ceases to exist. And so when facing some of these temporary things we we strangely worship, or facing these temporary kingdoms, remember your name, remember your calling. And so back to our friends in Daniel. The strange worship of the statue, it's going to do exactly what these things do. They point out and fish out the disloyal. It's obvious when you stand against them. Daniel 3, 7 and 9, and verse 12. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harps, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And at this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews, and they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, oh, I, I like to say this in this voice, Oh, king, may the king live forever. <laughs> They're beefing him up. But there are some Jews who among you have set up the affairs of province of Babylon and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who pay no attention, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. They made this, the three, the three men, they made this bold, resolute decision here to remain faithful to God. Even in this facing of overwhelming pressure, they chose to trust in his kingdoms and his promises that when that music played, they did not bow down. They trust in God's kingdom and his promises, knowing that no earthly power or idol could ever compare to the majesty of the one they worshiped. For them, strange worship, whether it was a demand to bow down to a golden image or conform to the world's expectations, held no weight. Their commitment to God, it was far deeper and more steadfast than any fleeting moment of conformity. They knew that God is faithful, that we can trust in his kingdom. There's no need to compromise. Daniel 3, 13 to 15 goes on. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true? that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of of gold that I have set up. Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to now, to fall down and worship the image I made, very good, very good. But if you don't worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? The king gave him one more chance. Those who refused to bow down to his decree would face the fiery furnace, a punishment that was not just a simple, ordinary flame. The furnace, it wasn't a household oven or even just a a modest fireplace. This was a massive industrial furnace. It was built for one purpose, to smelt metals and bake bricks at blistering temperatures. I imagine a furnace like this is what was used to build that 90-foot statue. 
so large and intense, the heat was so extreme that anyone thrown into it would not have a chance to survive. We even read that people who got near it would fall over dead. It was terrifying. It was a merciless instrument of death. And in that critical moment, they had several options before them. You know, don't bow down, okay. Or an easier way out of the intense pressure that they were under. This tension between the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world, it is something that we all face, where compromise might seem easy. It is easy. And it might be the the path of least resistance. See, they could have chosen to fall down and just pretend to worship. They could have outwardly bowed down to this idol, hoping to avoid conflict and punishment, all while privately maintaining their loyalty loyalty to God. They might have reasoned that, you know, if I bow down now, it's not going to hurt anybody. It certainly won't hurt me. Uh, It's a gesture, after all. No one would know the difference, and they would avoid the furnace. They could have worshipped the statue and then later asked God for forgiveness. They could have rationalized the bowing down to the idol for just a moment. Just, just a second, right? It wasn't a permanent betrayal. And that they could always ask for God's forgiveness afterwards. They, they could have honored the king in the position that he gave them. They could have justified their compromise by reasoning that, man, if we can stay alive and stay in power, then, then, then we'd be able to advocate for our people of Israel. Like if we are dead, then, then maybe these high positions would be filled with Babylonians. And, and who's going to stand up for Israel then and our people? They could have followed the customs of the foreign land. They could have argued that, you know, it's where we're at right now. We have to follow the customs of Babylon. It's a part of living in a foreign nation. It's just how things are here. It's what everybody else does. They could have minimized the seriousness of the situation. They, They could have thought, man, this isn't nearly as bad as what our ancestors did when they were the ones who willingly set up these idols. They made the golden calf after all, right? What's the big deal? Here's the problem with all these options. Each one involves a compromise. Putting temporary safety, putting, putting personal gain or comfort above trust and faithfulness in God. And so in this tension between God's kingdom and the kingdoms of this world, it is easy to justify compromises. But every small concession, it chips away at our worship to God. It leads us further from the faithfulness that he calls us to. And the challenge isn't just about avoiding consequences but it's about staying true to the one whose kingdom we belong to, even if the world makes it seem easier to conform. Daniel 3, 16 to 18 goes on. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Even if we are thrown, well, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Now, if you don't have this part highlighted or underlined in your Bible, I encourage you to do so in verse 18. But even if, but even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Wow. To have that kind of faith, like an even if kind of faith. And even if faith, it doesn't promise that bad things aren't going to happen to us in this life. Like our faith, it's not an insurance policy that protects us just when things go wrong. If it were, man, I think that would be a very selfish version of faith and we would just miss out on so much about the process and the growth that comes with trusting our Savior. Don't let faith be centered around security. Actually, God, he calls us to remain a beacon of hope because of what Christ has given us, especially when we face the uncertainty of our futures. So today, are you standing strong in God's promise to provide, even if the outcome doesn't go your way? Even if it all goes bad. 1 Peter 3, 13 to 18. It says, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, 
the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. Amen. When the kingdoms of this world demand strange worship, we remember who we are. We trust in God's kingdom, even if we don't know the outcome. Now here's the good news. You don't walk alone. Let's figure out what happens. In verse 19, the Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. His attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. And he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in the army to tie them and throw them into the blazing furnace. The king's command, it was so urgent and the furnace was so hot, the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace then king nebuchadnezzar he leaped to his feet in amazement and he asked his advisors he said wait weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire and they replied certainly your majesty and, and he said look i see four men walking around in the fire unbound unharmed and the fourth looks like a son of the gods nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and he shouted shadrach meshach and abednego servants of the most high god come out come here so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was there a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched and there was no smell of fire on them. Here's the transformative power of God. The Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own. There's so much more that we can learn from Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and even King Nebuchadnezzar. But studying their story today, we have confidence that we can have one foot in the kingdom of this world and one foot in the kingdom of God. And there lies our hope that there is a fourth man in the fire who walks with us. His name is Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. How are you feeling this morning? Does it seem like your world is constantly battling against these strange things that we worship? You know, does, does life feel like, you know, it might fall apart? I don't know. Like, what, what's, what's coming together ahead in my life or in the world around me? Do you feel like you are living through a fire right now? Here's the good news. God himself is ready to meet you right where you are. Offering a connection, an intimacy, a communion that's not only going to help survive, but it enables us to overcome. It empowers us. And in the midst of these shaking foundations of our world, in the meltdown that exposes what's, what's real, what's not, in the brokenness of Christ's own body, in the shedding of his blood and his resurrection, he comes to us with the grace that heals and makes us whole. And I'm encouraged by 1 Peter 4, 12-16. It says, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, but through something strange, as though something were strange, were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian in God's kingdom, as a disciple of Christ, as a disciple of Jesus, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. You are a living testimony. I am a living testimony. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, we are living testimonies to God's faithfulness. These strange things we worship come and go. Kingdoms come and go. But the kingdom of God remains forever. King Nebuchadnezzar's reign, it would come to an end. That statue one day, it would no longer be there. Probably crumbled to the ground. Torn apart, sold off. See, God, he will eventually remove um, 
rulers and, and things that demand strange worship. He is, has a promise to save his people, and that is his work to do. And so in the meantime, do not conform to the kingdoms of this world, but through it all, remember there is another in the fire with us. And he is a king who reigns forever. As we live as kingdom citizens in exile, awaiting our going home someday, we are called to walk righteously as living testimonies to our God. Our world is watching us. Remember 1 Peter 2.11. Dear friends, I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors then even if they, they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. Remember your name. Remember God is faithful. Remember you don't walk alone. Trust in God's kingdom, even if we don't know the outcome.